Hello everyone, it's Mike from Poke Phenomenal. Lately, Andrew's been deep in the mines working on the BQ series, so in his place, I'm here with another Nuzlocke challenge. The inspiration for this video came from Andrew's run of Pokemon Black 2 using only Chompy Boys. Both he and the audience really seemed to enjoy that challenge, so I wanted to try something similar, and that got me thinking, what kind of arbitrary challenge run could I play that would be as fun and creative? And the answer was quite simple. Everybody has an animal or two that they absolutely adore. For example, Andrew loves frogs and bears. And I can't blame him, frogs and bears are pretty great. But as for myself, I love me a good monkey. They're such carefree, fun-loving, devious creatures, and I can't help but envy the little bastards. Lucky for me, there are several monkey Pokemon that have been introduced throughout the series. And so I asked, could I beat a hardcore Nuzlocke using only a team of monkeys? The question begged an answer, and so my journey began. For this run, we're going to be playing White 2. Unfortunately, there isn't a single game where every monkey is available as an encounter, and while we could play a game like Sun and Moon or Sword and Shield for this challenge, I chose Gen 5 for two reasons. First, there are eight Pokemon available to me as encounters in these games, which will play an important part in this challenge that I'll explain in a minute. And second, I just generally prefer the older games and would rather play this over a Gen 7 or Gen 8 game. Look, I'm 28 years old, I'm stuck in my ways. Now, let's get into the rule set. We're playing a hardcore Nuzlocke, the rules for which I'll show here and also put in the description. The only change is that for this challenge, our only eligible encounters are Pokemon that have a monkey or ape-like appearance. To explain the difference between monkeys and apes, and how that impacts the run, I've invited Andrew to share his knowledge on the subject. Hey there, it's Andrew, and I'm here to talk about something that you don't care about. After all, I've got to use this anthropology degree for something. So I want to welcome you to the Monkey Corner. Now, Mike is calling this run monkeys only because it rolls off the tongue better, but in order to have enough Pokemon to sustain the run, he'll actually be using both monkeys and apes to conquer the Unova region. But how do we tell the difference between a monkey and an ape? Is a question you never asked, but I'm going to answer it anyway. So the primary difference between a monkey and an ape is whether or not they have a tail. As a general rule, monkeys have visible tails and apes don't. So Pokemon like Panpour, Apom, and Mankey are monkeys while Pokemon like Oranguru and Darmanitan are apes. Other factors like body size and amount of hair on the face come into play, but the easiest way of telling whether you're dealing with a monkey or an ape is to look for the tail. But, weirdly enough, some Pokemon seem to switch from monkey to ape or vice versa in their evolutions. Chimchar has a more ape-like face and posture, but it has a tail that grows longer with each evolution, and should probably be classified as a monkey. Grookey is about as classic of a monkey as you can get, but upon evolution, it loses its tail and grows into the more robust body of an ape. And then there's the Slackoff line, which starts as an obvious sloth before evolving into a creature with a chimp-like body and, eventually, something resembling a gorilla. As you can see, although the series as a whole does a pretty good job at representing Pokemon as either monkey or apes, it's not quite so simple to choose Pokemon for a monkeys only run, and Mike will instead be using members from across the primate family and beyond. And at the end of the day, even if some of these Pokemon are probably apes, are they not also monkey in a way? As a licensed anthropologist, I'd say the answer is yes they are. So there's a lecture no one asked for, and now I'm gonna get out of here and go watch some videos of orangutans. Back to you Mike. As of Gen 5, there are 8 Pokemon lines that fall under this category. There are also 8 gyms that will have to defeat in order to reach the Pokemon League. When I realized this, I decided to have some fun with the way we're handling encounters in this run. Instead of catching our encounters in-game, we're going to receive a random encounter in each of the gym cities, meaning we will get one encounter prior to each gym battle. This way, we have the potential to have a full party of 6 and 2 extras by the time we reach the League, while also giving us consistent encounters throughout the run to hopefully mitigate our potential losses. The fact that our encounters are randomized will also keep things interesting and hopefully add to the difficulty. With all that said, let's jump right in. Okay. We start by naming our player character. I choose the girl and name her Dixie in order to raise more awareness about the injustice of this character's exclusion from the Smash Bros roster. Dixie Kong is an incredible heroine who has starred in some of the greatest platformers of all time, and she deserves far more recognition and respect than she has received. <sighs> Moving on, we then name our rival K. Rool after the ultimate enemy of the Kong clan. 
In Aspersia City, we get our starter, and instead of randomizing our starter for the first gym, I choose to go with Chimchar. Considering he is a starter and a monkey, it just makes sense. We get our Chimchar and name him Diddy, and after the initial early game setup, including two rival battles with K. Rool and an encounter with Team Plasma at the Flocacy Ranch, we're ready to return to Aspersia City for our first gym battle against Charon. We have a bit of back and forth with his Batrat before landing a crit ember that takes it out and forces him to send out the Lil Pup. Although it does get us down to 3 HP, Diddy isn't ready to call it quits this early, and pulls through with Ember, earning us the basic badge. This fight was honestly one of the main reasons I decided against playing in challenge mode, because I didn't know how difficult it would be to take down Charon's 3 Pokemon while only dealing neutral damage, and also taking neutral damage in return. Considering how close that victory was, I think I made the right call, so I hope you can all forgive me for taking the bitch baby route. After the battle, Diddy evolves into Monferno, and we then head through Route 19 and Flockacy Town towards Verbank city. When we arrive in Verbank, it's time to get our first encounter. Let's see who it's gonna be. For our first encounter, we get a Mankey and name him Cranky. But while I do love to see a Mankey, another fighting type isn't exactly the best encounter for Roxy, who uses poison types. I guess we'll just have to continue relying on Diddy for now. And what I can only hope is a sign of continued good fortune, Diddy quickly defeats her coughing with a crit ember, before also taking down her Whirlipede with a single attack. Diddy is, quite literally, on fire. With a toxic badge in hand, we're forced to go through Pokestar Studios. Come on guys, the strikes just ended. Unbelievable. After that, we confront Team Plasma again, and Roxy's father decides to give us a ride to Castelia City before returning to the big screen. Now it's time for our second encounter. Who's it gonna be this time? For our second encounter, we get a Panseer and name her Wrinkly. Although a fire type doesn't add much to our team in terms of diversity, it's honestly not the worst encounter at this point, as she can be helpful in the battle against Berg. Arriving at the gym, we're told that Berg is out. Suddenly, Iris appears and offers to help us find Team Plasma, before leading us to the sewers. After battling some Team Plasma grunts with K. Rool, we find Berg and also encounter Colrus for the first time, which means it's time for the next gym battle. Diddy makes quick work of his Swadloon with Flame Wheel, and after tanking some smackdowns from his Dwebble, we take that down too. Levani finally comes out, but it's no match for Diddy and we sail to victory. After getting the Insect Badge, we head up Route 4, where we battle Colrus for the first time. And while his steel types can be annoying, his team is no match for our firefighting starter. We then make our way to the Desert Resort and get a Firestone, which we'll use to evolve Wrinkly later. After passing through Join Avenue, we arrive in Nimbasa City, meaning it's time for our third encounter. Place your bets, everyone. For our third encounter, we get a Panpour and name her Tiny. Unlike with Wrinkly, Tiny definitely can't help us in the fight against Elisa, so we're forced to help ourselves as we return to Route 4 and pick up the Dig TM. When we arrive at the gym, we're told Elisa is out and to check the old gym out instead, so we spend some time battling members of the upper class and riding the questionably operated roller coasters until Elisa returns and is ready to battle us. Before we head back to the gym, Cranky evolves into Primeape while leveling up, and I have an important realization. Elisa starts with a Molga and can't be hit by Dig. Utilizing my gigantic brain, we return to the desert resort and enter the Relic Castle to grab the Rock Tomb TM. With that, we head back to Nimbasa City to face Elisa. We start with Cranky against her Emolga and go for Rock Tomb, but she outspeeds us and lands a Volt Switch, switching into her Flaffy. Flaffy gets hit with a Rock Tomb and has its speed lowered, and we then take it out with Dig. Emolga returns, and my big brain seems to shift into monkey mode, as I go for Rock Tomb again, while she uses Volt Switch to switch into Zebstrika. This play works out because we now outspeed the Zebstrika and can finish it with Dig. With Emolga back on the front line, we land a strong Rock Tomb, while her next Volt Switch gets us in the red. Knowing we'll be able to outspeed, we go for Assurance and finish the fight. While it wasn't the cleanest battle I've ever had, it was nice giving Cranky a chance to shine. You still got it, old man. With the Bolt Badge in tow, we help K. Rool against some more Team Plasma Grunts before entering Route 5, where we battle the Heartbreaker Charles and head towards Driftvale City. After crossing the bridge and entering town, it's time for our fourth encounter. Who can it be now? For our fourth encounter, we get an Apom and name him Lanky. He may not offer much right now, but his versatility is a welcome addition to the team. After learning more about the schism between old and new Team Plasma, it's time to face Clay. Prior to the battle, we evolve Lanky into Ambipom and Wrinkly into Simiseer, while also equipping Cranky with a tactical air balloon. 
We lead the fight with Tiny, who, although small, is able to outspeed his Croc Rock and one-shot it with Scald. His Sand Slash also goes down to a single Scald, and when Excadrill comes out, we stay in and nearly take it out. Unfortunately, Tiny isn't quite strong enough, and he then lands a strong Bulldoze that lowers our speed. We switch into Cranky and tank a Slash which pops our Air Balloon. We then avoid a Rock Slide to finish him with Karate Chop, earning us the Quake Badge. After beating Clay, he forces K. Rool and I to participate in the Pokemon World Tournament. We sweep with Lanky against K. Rool and Charon before switching to Diddy against Colrez. With that over, we help K. Rool storm Team Plasma's nearby ship before we're forcefully ejected. K. Rool runs off, and we follow Charon onto Route 6, where we get the Surf HM, after which we take a quick detour to return to Flockacy Town and Route 19 to get a Water Stone and evolve Tiny into Simipore. We then proceed through Chargestone Cave and arrive in Mistralton City, where Diddy evolves into Inferni. Before we fight Skyla, it's time for our fifth encounter. Take it away, Swanky! For our fifth encounter, we get a Pan Sage and name him Funky. Unfortunately for the Cool Kong, he won't be of much help in this battle. This is starting to look like a trend, but we make our way over to Lost Lorn Forest to get a Leaf Stone and evolve him anyway. Our team at this point is not well equipped to take on Skyla. I wouldn't say monkeys are exactly proficient in aerial combat, and so I decide to return to Drifale to have the Move Tutor teach Diddy Thunder Punch. Hopefully, this will be enough to get us the victory. Diddy takes down her Swoobat with a single Electrified Fist, and the Swana goes down to a quad effective hit as well. Finally, we switch to Flame Wheel against her Skarmory, which survives and sets up an agility. Luckily for us, it's only able to land a weak air cutter before we finish it with another Flame Wheel and end the fight. With the jet badge in hand, Skyla offers to fly Professor Juniper and I to Lentimus Town, so we travel to the Celestial Tower to get her. After landing, Professor Juniper asks us to go to Opelucid City to talk to Drayden about the legendary dragons, and we help Bianca traverse Reversal Mountain to come out on the other side of Undela Town. But before we can proceed further, we have another battle with K. Rule. His Oon Pheasant survives a Thunder Punch and lands a powerful Air Slash, but we take him down with two more Thunder Punches following a heal. When Samurott comes out, we switch into Funky and set up a Weed Seed, before taking it down with Seed Bomb. He sends out his own Simi Sage, but because there can only be one Funky Monkey, we take it down with a Crit Acrobatics. We then make our way through Route 13 and arrive in Lacanosa Town, where we meet up with Bianca and Professor Juniper to learn more about the legendary dragons. Afterwards, K. Rool and I encounter Zinzolin and his lackey, and team up to take them down. After they flee, we head west through Route 12, ruin some guy's winning streak on the village bridge, and make our way through Route 11 before arriving in Opelousid City. It's time for our sixth encounter. Hmm, I'm running out of good transitions, maybe I'll just... For our sixth encounter, we get a Darumaka and name him DK. Despite having two fire types already, I'm glad to have the main man finally join the team, and we quickly level him up. Yeah. We also head back to Drifail to teach Lanky Ice Punch, which we'll need for the fight against Drayden. Lanky lands a strong Ice Punch on his Drudicon to start off, and though we get hit with a weak slash, we finish it off with one more. His Flygon can't handle the cold and falls to a single blow, which forces Drayden to send out his Haxorus which survives an Ice Punch, to then heal with a Citrus Berry and set up a Dragon Dance. This would normally frighten me, but a stat boost to Dragon is no match for our opposable thumbs, as we still outspeed him and take him down, earning us the Legend Badge. After the battle, Drayden tells us about Kirim and the DNA Splicers, just as Team Plasma arrive with their flying ship to freeze the town over. We battle several Grunts and also have a rematch with Zindelin before the DNA Splicers are taken by the Shadow Triad. We then get a call from K. Rool and Charon, who suspects that Team Plasma are in Humalau City, and we return to Undela Town to go through the Marine Tube to sniff them out. Now that we're here, it's time for our final encounter. Let's do this, one last time. For our final encounter, we get a Slackoth and name him Chunky. Even with Truant holding him back, Slacking is such a strong Pokemon that we quickly level him up and add him to the team. In preparation for Marlin, we also have the local Move Tutor teach Funky Giga Drain, after which we're ready to take on the gym. His Karakos is sturdy, allows it to survive a Seed Bomb, but after Marlin heals, we get it back down to 1 with Giga Drain to bring ourselves back to full health, and then finish him with an Acrobatics. His Wailord and Jellicent soon follow, but given that neither of them have Sturdy, they both go down to Sea Bomb, and within moments, we've defeated the final gym leader. With the Wave Badge secured, all that's left to do is stop Team Plasma once and for all. You know, just like we did in the last game. On Route 22, we encounter Colrus again, who gives us his machine and tells us to head to the Seaside Cave on Route 21. 
We then head south through Route 21 and the cave, before finding Team Plasma's ship in the cove. On board, we battle through more grunts before finding Zinzolin in the command center, who reveals to us that Trapped Kirim is the source of the ship's power. We defeat him and his lackey yet again, before we're ejected from the ship. As they make their way to the giant chasm, we follow in pursuit and find the ship again, board it again, fight the grunts again, and battle Zinzolin before defeating him again. We then enter the control room, where we battle Colres for the last time. We start with Wrinkly against his Magneton, and do good damage with Flame Burst before we're paralyzed by Thunder Wave. Colrus heals up, but Flame Burst gets it down in the red again. Magneton then goes for Volt Switch and switches into Magnezone, but loses a lot of health to a powerful Flame Burst. This is an unfortunate situation, but since I don't want to switch anyone in at this point, I allow Wrinkly to be taken down by Discharge. We then send in Chunky, who finishes the Magnezone off with a Bulldoze. He sends out Kling Clang next, and we trap it into using Shift Gear with Encore before switching into Diddy to finish it off. He then sends in his Behem, and we switch back into Chunky to tank a Psychic and retaliate with a crit strength. Next up is his Matang, but it isn't able to do enough damage to stop our Chunky boy and goes down to two Bulldozes. Finally, the Magneton returns, and though it manages to paralyze us, we switch into Cranky and take it down. After the battle, we abandon Ship to send Wrinkly off to the Great Beyond. She lived a good life, and now it's time for her to eat all the bananas she wants. We make our way back on board to finally encounter Getsis, who forces us to listen to a douchey monologue on how he plans to take over Unova by turning into a frozen wasteland and, wait a minute, where have I seen this before? He then leaves to enact his plan while we battle the Shadow Triad. Once they've been dealt with, it's time to stop Getsis. We encounter Getsis in the inner cave when he summons Kiram to attack. N appears to lend us a hand, but this leads to Gessus fusing Reshiram and Kiram and goading us into challenging his creation. Luckily, Diddy is more than capable of handling this, as Kiram goes down to two brick rigs. With his plans easily thwarted, Gessus tries to take us out himself, which leads into one of the hardest battles in the game. He starts with Cough Egregious, which has a very annoying moveset. Fortunately, we came prepared with a Pecha Berry, which allows Diddy to shake off his poison and take it down with Shadow Claw. Gessus then sends in Seismitoad, and we switch into Funky, who eats an Earthquake, before immediately getting back to full with the Crit Giga Drain. Next up is the Electros. Although it knows both Flamethrower and Acrobatics, I stay in and go for Seed Bomb. It goes for Flamethrower, but Funky tanks it, and we finish the eel off with Seed Bomb. He swings into Drapion next, so we call on Chunky to wall it out and take it down with Bulldoze. We stay in against the Toxicroak to hit a Bulldoze, but we're quickly forced to switch into Diddy to finish it off. Finally, Getsu sends out Hydreigon. This thing is always terrifying, but we manage to dodge a Dragon Rush and take it down with two Brick Breaks. With Getsu defeated, Team Plasma is all but disbanded, and our final task is to make our way to the Pokemon League. After healing up, we traverse Route 23 and arrive at Victory Road. We avoid as many trainers as possible to prevent any tragedy on the last leg of our journey, making it all the way to the end before K. Roll appears to challenge us one last time. We start with Diddy and go for Thunder Punch on his Oonpheasant, but it survives and throws us off our rhythm with Swagger. Diddy manages to hit through the confusion to take it out, and he then sends in Bufalon. Knowing that Diddy will most likely die if we take confusion damage, we switch into Chunky, who tanks an Earthquake. We're able to do some damage with Strength, but when Bufalon hits a crit head charge, Chunky just isn't able to handle it. Thanks to the damage Chunky dealt, we're able to send Diddy back out while K. Roll heals, quickly getting rid of it with two Brick Rates. He then sends in Samurai, and we switch over to Funky on a Surf and eat the damage. Giga Drain gets us back up, which allows us to endure a nasty Ice Beam before finishing it off. Finally, his Semi Sage comes out, and we employ our classic strategy of switching into Diddy and finishing the fight. Chunky was taken before his time, just like another legend, but with Victory Road behind us, we finally arrive at the Pokemon League, and begin our preparations for the fights ahead. Let's see the rundown. Diddy the Infernape. Our fun-loving leader, whose power and moveset always get the job done. Cranky the Primeape. Our crotchety old man, whose indomitable spirit keeps us all going. Tiny the Simipore. Our small but fierce Surf and Ice Beam user. Lanky the Ambipom. Our speedy goofball, who nicely rounds out the team. Funky the Simisage. Our main monkey, who offers important coverage. DK the Darmanitan. Our fiery powerhouse, with a brain of mush and a heart of gold. With six Kongs remaining, we're ready to take on the Elite Four and become the champion. Let's see if these chumps can handle the DK crew. I take on Grimsley first, assuming he should be the easiest with our two fighting types, and start the fight with Cranky against his Lyperd. It goes for Fake Out and Attract, 
but we eventually break through and take it down with Brick Break. He brings up Bisharp next, who goes down to a quad effective Brick Break, but when the Crocodile comes out, we switch over to Funky. He gets hit by Earthquake, but is able to take down his enemy with Giga Drain and regain some HP. Finally, Grimsley sends out Scrafty, so we go for Seed Bomb for about half health before switching into Diddy to finish the fight. Next up is Chantel, whose ghost types present an annoying obstacle. We all know how much monkeys fear the occult. We lead with DK against her Kafa Grigis and take it down to half with Fire Punch. But unfortunately, its mummy ability replaces DK's sheer force, and the second Fire Punch isn't able to finish it. She then heals, and we land one more Fire Punch with a Lucky Bird, before we switch into Lanky, tank a Psychic, and take it down with Shadow Claw. She then sends out Golurk, so we switch into Funky to finish it off with two Giga Drains. But this switch unfortunately also draws her Chandelure out. We have to move into Tiny, who gets hit with a strong Fire Blast and retaliates with Surf for the KO. Finally, Chantel sends out Driftblood, and we make one more switch into Lanky, who tanks a Thunderbolt before one-shotting it with a Crit Ice Punch. I decide to fight Caitlyn next because, given that I don't have great answers to her psychic types, I'd rather take her on while I still have a full team. We start with Lanky against her Musharna, dealing good damage with Shadow Claw, but it goes for Yawn, causing Lanky to fall asleep after we take it out next turn. She then sends out Reuniclus, and we switch into Funky and avoid a Focus Blast. We're able to take it down with two C-Bombs, but she then switches into Sigilyph, and we have to bring out Tiny to tank the ensuing Ice Beam. We land a strong Ice Beam of our own, and tank a Psychic before finishing it off with a second one, after which Caitlyn brings in her Gothitelle. We switch into DK and are immediately paralyzed by Thunderbolt. We then tank a Psychic and land a strong Fire Punch, but she heals from her Citrus Berry, and it's here I realize that we're not going to make it out of this one without losing someone. With a heavy heart, we switch into Cranky, who eats the Thunderbolt and goes for an Assurance, before he finally goes down to Psychic. Off the back of this sacrifice, we send in Diddy to finish the Gothitelle with Shadow Claw. We easily could have wiped there, so while Cranky's death isn't easy to swallow, at least the old man can rest knowing we're still in this. Finally, we go into face Marshall, our final challenge of the main lead 4. We don't have great options against his fighting types either, but we can't turn back now. DK lands a strong Zen headbutt on his throw to open up the fight, but he responds with a bulldoze, lowering our speed. He heals as we go for Fire Punch, and we're able to take it out with two hits. Marshall then sends in Conkeldur, and we stay in, dealing good damage with Zen Headbutt and forcing him to consume his Citrus Berry. The Conkeldur goes for Bulk Up, and although we land another Zen Headbutt, it isn't enough to take him out, and he connects a massive Stone Edge that finishes off DK. We send out Funky, who takes Conkeldur out with Acrobatics in Revenge, and then do the same to the Mean Shao. Finally, he sends in Sock who's able to survive an acrobatics with Sturdy, and land a strong payback before we end the fight next turn. There wasn't much we could do to prevent DK's death, but it still hurts to see him go. The King of the Jungle may have been slain right before we could seize our glory, but we will seize it. For him. <laughs> with Elite Four defeated, it's time to face Iris and claim our title of champion. Against Hydreigon, Lanky shrugs off a Dragon Pulse before taking it down with two Ice Punches and she sends out Drodagon next. It survives an Ice Punch, and is able to hit a Focus Blast that's powerful enough to take Lanky down. We send in Tiny to finish it off with an Ice Beam, and she responds with her Lapras. Switching into Funky and avoiding a Sing, we go for a Giga Drain, but the Lapras survives, this time succeeding in putting us to sleep. We fail to get the early wake up, and are hit by an Ice Beam that gets us down to 3 HP, but Funky refuses to take it lying down, waking up in the final moment to take the Lapras out. Iris then sends out her ace, Haxorus. We land a final seed bomb with Funky before he goes down valiantly to Earthquake, after which we send in Tiny to try and end things with Ice Beam. Unfortunately, the Haxorus survives and gets off a Dragon Dance, making our situation even dicier. Iris then heals, giving us another chance to launch an Ice Beam. Haxorus then lands a devastating Earthquake before we finish it with Ice Beam. It's all but over now. She sends out Agron, but it goes down to a single serve. And finally, she sends out Archaeops just in time for it to drown in the Great Flood, as did its ancestors. With Iris defeated, we've become the champion and beaten the Nuzlocke. If I had a nickel for every time I made it at the end of a relatively easy run, only to nearly wipe during the champion battle, I'd have three nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it is concerning. I hope it made for an exciting finale at least. This challenge was definitely doable given the diversity in the encounters, especially with the elemental monkeys, but there were still some close calls. 
I probably could have upped the difficulty, but I really enjoyed how this run went, and hope to do more videos like it in the future. Andrew and I have already thought of more animal-themed challenges we want to try, but let us know in the comments what you'd like to see in the future. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing to the channel. We've got more Nuzlocks, challenge runs, and discussions coming down the pipeline. And don't worry, the next BQ video is on its way. Keep it funky, monkeys, and remember, stay phenomenal.